So over the last few months, there's been a lot of anger and frustration. Um, and as you're coming back to school, you may want to do a better job of learning about and understanding how racism works. Uh, you might be a teacher, you might be a student, or you might be someone who's just learning chemistry somewhere. Um, and I want to talk about what that should look like in the classroom and try and be a little bit of help. Most people have a faulty definition of what racism is. To a lot of people, the definition of racism is that it's someone that's bad. It's someone that I don't like. Uh, and you can see that when people weaponize racism as an attack on others. Uh, this idea that there are good people who are not racist and bad people that are racist is, is very much not productive. In fact, I would say that you really should avoid labeling people as racist because it undermines a substantial component of racism. So what I found helpful is that people who are intentional and are just openly admitting that I don't like these people because of their race or because of their skin tone or because of their religion should be defined as bigots and bigotry. And there's, there's an intent behind that because most things that happen that are racist are done by people who have good intentions, but they have a negative impact. And so for myself, I know that I as a teacher have definitely had negative impacts where I've done something racist, even though I, I assure you that I never had malintentions towards someone else. Uh, and I don't consider myself to be a bigot, but that doesn't mean that I can't have a racist impact and even on someone that I care for. And I think that's really important. So if we go to define racism, we want to include intent and impact, and we want to separate it from labeling people into groups because group dynamics where there are bad people and there are good people is counterproductive. There are things that I've done that have been bad, and there are things that I've done that have been good. By either metric, you could assign me to one of these groups, and so doesn't really make any difference where you put me. It didn't change anything that I did or the intents or the impacts that I've had on people. And so instead of focusing on people, we should focus on things that we can control. We should look at actions, what your language is like, what comments you make, and what policies and rules do you use in your life? And that can be institutional policies, like here at school we might have a dress code that is racist, or it might just be general guidelines. I might really like being polite. And that might not turn out well for some groups of people sometimes because that might be used as a weapon. And so when we talk about a more productive definition, we want to focus on things that we can control and we want to view them through the lens of, is this racist and is this anti-racist? You heard me say earlier, not racist and anti-racist much better term than not racist. Not racist implies kind of not race. And for white people in particular, we tend not to see race until we see someone who is non-white. And that leads to actually a lot of racism. For me, I would define racism as something that has a negative impact on someone or a group of people because of their race. And so anything I do can fall into that definition, right? I can make a seating chart and in that seating chart, I can harm some of the students where, where based on how I separate or put together, there's lots of ways that I can have a negative impact on a group of students, okay? And what we want to do is we want to be continually going through and analyzing what we do from the lens of, was this racist or was this anti-racist? If it was racist, can I make amends? How big was the impact? Who was impacted by it? If it was anti-racist, what did I fix? What did I do? Can I do that again? Can I do that even better? And that process is very exhausting to people who look through the lens of bad people and good people. Because they're constantly saying, oh, you're bad, oh, you're good. And I want to caution you that a lot of people fall into this trap where they think, it's okay because I'm in the good group. And when you think, I'm in the good group, what you do is you weaponize racism to judge other people. And what you should do instead is judge actions, comments, and policies. Because otherwise, you're actually reinforcing the ideals of white supremacy. So when we say something like Christopher Columbus, he was a bad person, it's far better to go through and say, you know, Christopher Columbus committed genocide, which is awful. He also put in an enormous amount of bravery to do this, this 
quest across the sea or something. I don't know if that's actually true. Or not, but I know he went across the sea. I don't know how great. Whatever. You get the idea. We should judge based on what they did. We should judge George Washington based on owning slaves, and we should judge him based on being the first president of the country. And too many people are trying to go, well, there's this bad thing, so he's a bad person. Or there's this good thing, and there's a good person. And that leads to this divide where people feel stuck. And when people feel stuck, then they continue to do these things that are harmful. And we keep trying to push them into see how bad you are, instead of saying, see how bad what you did is. And there's two different mindsets to that. And if you're familiar with the fixed and the growth mindset, I know they get overused in, in education inappropriately, but, but those would be kind of, we're trying to push towards the growth mindset where we're saying everything can be construed as racist or anti-racist, as opposed to a fixed mindset where we say you're a bad person, you're a good person. Who's responsible for that? Well, as you can anticipate, everyone is. So if you're the teacher, what can you do, what do you do that harms students based on the race? And I think that teachers often have a misconception when we have this discussion. And they're drawn to thinking about their black students, and they're drawn to thinking about their students of color, and their students who are in, I'm gonna say minority groups, um, in the sense that there are fewer of them in a class. Okay, so uh, if, you have a lot, uh, if you have a couple of Muslim students, you might consider them when you think of this. What we don't do is we don't think of the majority, and that's problematic. So what are you doing to your white students to teach them how to be a student who understands the impact of the decisions they make and can avoid doing this idea of separating people into groups as good and bad? Because they need to know that. I used to be in high school, and I was never taught that. So when I went to go teach chemistry, I ended up being a teacher who had this misconception and that led to harm of my students. Whereas if someone had told me in high school and been able to get through to me like, hey, this is how this works, I would have listened, I would have paid attention. So for students, you are absolutely responsible for this. Uh, if you look at your peer-to-peer -peer relationships in the class, it's common that, that teachers will do everything right in their ability, but then students will undermine each other. Students will ask questions and create a sense that these people don't belong in here and these people do. And that reinforces each other. That comes from students, that comes from policies. You can disrupt that. And so if you can, do. And really, anyone should go on that list. But what can you do to help? Okay. Learn how your brain works. When you watch this video, you, your brain takes in all the information. So you might have noticed my pen, you might have noticed my shirt. But there are other things that your brain is taking in, like that's in this bottom corner here, or this bottom corner here, that your brain is taking in and saying, this isn't important. So your brain automatically filters, for lack of a better term, an inordinate amount of data and information and observations. So when I look at a room, I see the whole room. My brain takes it all in. But if there's something dangerous over there, I'm going to be drawn to that thing. If there's something moving over here, I'm going to be drawn to that thing. So your brain has a way of filtering through what we call system one. And this isn't just like your heart is beating because your brain is telling it. It's your brain is taking in information and telling what is valuable and what is not. And you are not your system one, you are your system two. Your system two is your thing that's thinking. And you're trying to make connections. You're going, what is he talking about? Can I see different things in the room right now? And you're trying to focus your brain's activity from that system one. So it turns out this system one, when it sees people that are black, or it sees people that are Latino, that it filters, it does things differently. It perceives things differently. If I, a white teacher, am listening to a black group of students talk and a white group of students talk at the same um, decibel level, I might perceive them to be different. I might perceive that black group to be louder than the other group, even though they're the same volume. Or I might have a student say the exact same language and the exact same tone, but I'm going to perceive one as being more disrespectful or more combative. And we all do this. Okay, to different degrees, sure, but, but you need to know that your brain will naturally acclimate you to make different decisions. And the hard part about that is you don't know that you do that. And so the experimental evidence for this is that they do things where they will submit a resume. Here's resume one, here's resume two, and they're identical. And this one has a name that's a stereotypical black name, and this one has a name that's a stereotypical white name. So this is Greg, and this is Jamal. Other than that, the education, the experience, everything about them is identical. And they pass them out, and then people read uh, Jamal's, and they go, oh, you know what, I'm really not a big fan of his educational experience. And they pass. 
and they read Greg's and they go, oh, you know what, I really like his work experience. So even though they were able to convince themselves that the decision was not based on race, the only difference between these is the race. And so we find that when we train actors and actresses to go out and do job interviews, that, that black and Latino people get called back uh, less frequently and get hired less frequently than white people do for the exact same interview. Okay, so that's going to happen in your brain, and you need to learn how that works so you understand that. Uh, and then the second piece is have the courage to evaluate your actions and comments and their impact and be able to go, you know what, I, I was wrong. If someone tells you that you just did something that's racist, pause and listen. And go, okay, was it? You know, it's very easy to get defensive and to kind of start to move into a different part of your brain called the amygdala, where you get defensive and emotional. And instead, you just can pause and think, was I doing that? And was I being harmful? But that's really important to being able to have better relationships and make people feel more included. So it's a thing called stereotype threat, and there are ways to minimize it using growth mindset, using representation. Um, when you work in groups, that you make sure that everyone feels included within that group. And you think about how isolating it could be if you're in a minority situation where you're the only one of or two of, of a group in a class, that, that that could be very daunting. And to make sure that, that students are working together in groups because the social interactions you have between your peers are critical for your learning. So if you have a student in a class who doesn't feel like they belong in a group and they don't interact with the group well, that's going to harm their learning. Even if they go home and study really hard on their own later, you need that ability to kind of connect what the people are talking about with the social environment with the content itself in order to have a stronger memory of that content. Okay. Don't assume ownership. This is something I do all the time. I might have even done this in the video. I don't remember. But, but I will say, oh, that's great. Oh, that is, you, you did a good job here. And what I'm doing there is I'm saying, I am able to evaluate you. I, as the white male, am able to go through and say, this is what this is. So even if I'm giving a compliment, I might be going, I'm the one who gets to judge whether your work is good or bad. And that's something that is subtle, and there's plenty of other things besides this you can do. And if you have one, feel free to leave it in the comments for other people to read, and I'll add it on if you want. But these are some simple things to do. And just read and listen and make people feel included. Uh, I'll, I'll put some books in of how your brain works that can help you with that, and some books that are just good books about anti-racism in general. Um, but try it, and, and be okay that you won't be perfect at it first. I wasn't. You know, I made mistakes, and I apologized and tried to undo the harm that I did, and try to do better the next time. And so give yourself a little grace if you're new to this, that it's going to be unusual, and you might struggle flipping between these different pieces, but try. And try genuinely. You know, don't try to try and be, I'm the good person. Try to do it in the sense that I want this to be better.